after the war, nobody, meaning Polish people <laughs> or Jewish people, uh, the, 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 the knowledge in general during the war was quite limited. It was not well known. <clears throat> I'm not even sure if the Polish government in exile, frankly, knew what the Polish legation was doing in Switzerland. Uh, those people who obviously survived knew they survived, but I don't think, honestly, they knew the full story of how they survived. Uh, they knew somehow they got the passport. Did they actually know about Alexander Lewadosh? Probably not. Um, and um, uh, Polish people, um, and I blame this on the communist uh, uh, regime rule after the war uh, in general. Uh, what happened during the war was quiet and nobody would be interested, frankly, I think, in researching this. Uh, and it's to his credit that Jakob Komoch, in memory and honor of his predecessor, uh, is doing what he's been doing. So um, I think there's really no blame. Uh, the Holocaust, World War II, was a major, major event uh, in which millions and millions of people, Jewish and non-Jewish, were killed. Uh, even if, you, even if all of these people who could have received passports would have been saved, we're talking about some thousand, two, three thousand, I'm not sure the number. So it is quite minuscule, uh, but uh, it is a courageous story. Uh, personally, I believe that uh, Alexander Wadosh sh should be recognized by Yad Vashem as one of the righteous among nations, and the other uh, Polish uh, legation members. Uh, I know that uh, none of the Jews can because that's not part of the Yad Vashem protocol. Uh, it has to be a, a, a non-Jew. Um, and I think you were asking me, 10 years ago when I mentioned I was at Masua in Israel and I was reviewing the archival records of Dr. Schwarzbaum that are now part of the records of Alfred Silberschein, I found this letter which I had translated. Sorry, I have to look at my iPhone. Uh, I have it to translation. So the letter is on the official letterhead of, I'll read it in German, the Zentrale der Jüdische Elterstraße. I'm very bad. But translated, it's the head office of the Jewish elders' councils of East Upper Silesia, Osterbischlesen, seat of Sosnowiec, uh, the department management, and the letter is dated June 2nd, 1943. Uh, June 18th or so was a major transport of Jews deportation to Auschwitz. The final one was August 1st started. So on June 2nd, uh, Monjak Merin signed it, um, and he sent this letter to Alfred Schwarzbaum in Lausanne. Dear Mr. Schwarzbaum, we would like to ask you, by means of this letter, to refrain from correspondence with private persons in our territory until you receive further information from us. At the same time, we ask you to inform also other friends, open parentheses, Schwab, about the above mentioned. Should you have the need to settle any matters we would be pleased to stay at your disposal with best regards, Moshe Israel Merin. So uh, Merin knew, and, and survivors have written about the fact that Merin knew about these passports, and he opposed them. Um, and that is based upon survivor testimony. Uh, I believe it may have even been referenced in a book written by Pavel Wiedemann after the war called of a bestia, um, but this letter <laughs> is the evidence that in fact he was asking uh, Schwarzbaum in Lausanne to stop corresponding with individuals in the ghetto because it was the correspondence that was essential. Uh, these passports uh, were issued that had real photographs of the Jews in the ghetto in their names, not fake names, not Polish names, and their birth dates. So the correspondence was essential to get the passports, correspondence out of Benjamin 
and then correspondence back to the Jews in Benjamin. Until this year, until this year, I really never heard the word anti-Polonism. I'm not even sure if that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> uh, I did know Jewish people who felt that, uh, not Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, but children and grandchildren uh, that had a negative view of Poland uh, because they felt somehow without knowing that somehow Polish people could have done more on Polish lands to help Jewish people. And again, based upon lack of education, not knowing really what happened in Poland, the lands of Poland during the war. Um, I never heard of the word anti-Polonism. <laughs> I certainly heard the word anti-Semitism. Um, and unfortunately, this year, because of what's called in Polish the anti-defamation law, which in the vernacular outside of Poland is called the anti-Holocaust law, um, it has stirred up resentment by Jewish people throughout the world because uh, the feeling is we, especially, I live in the United States, we have no limitations on freedom of speech. And you, we, I can get up and say that if not for FDR, millions of Jews could have been saved. I can also say that FDR mur murdered Jews and nothing can happen to me. Uh, this new law in Poland uh, would prevent people, Polish people, uh, or American people from going to Auschwitz and teaching the Holocaust to students from saying things. So in our grain as Americans, that goes against our grain. You should not prevent people in Poland from saying anything about anything, even about the Holocaust. So um, the Holocaust is a very, very, very um, um, sore topic for Jewish people. Um, it's, it strikes a nerve, a chord. And if anybody in any place tries to prevent any speech, etc., there'll be a reaction. And there was a reaction. And uh, I think there's a law of physics for every action, for, there's a reaction. So unfortunately, uh, certain anti-Polish press and, and, and um, talk because of the law also brought out and in the United States they're anti-Semites and in every country in the world they're anti-Semites. It, in my view, and this now is my view as opposed to history, allowed uh, in Poland Polish anti-Semites to come out more open and with their views. And frankly, in my view, Polish people who just never even thought about the subject of Polish-Jewish relations, etc., see Poland being attacked from abroad. And Polish people, there's nothing wrong with being nationalistic in my view. Uh, when you go to the World Cup or to uh, the Olympics, everybody is nationalistic. <laughs> uh, but the idea of, of, the, of the Olympics is uh, we play in, in, as friends, whoever wins, wins, and we don't preach hatred against people. And nationalism, in my view, there's nothing wrong as long as that does not encompass preaching hatred against other peoples. Uh, unfortunately, nationalism in the United States, in Poland, and many other countries has brought out that element uh, that preaches hatred, and that's a bad thing. Um, and hopefully, uh, I have been to Poland almost 20 times. Uh, first time I came, the first two times I came was before 1989, uh, and I've seen how, uh, forget about your economy and everything, but how Polish-Jewish, Polish-Israeli relations have amazingly come a long way from the Iron Curtain of silence and et cetera 
Uh, and this year was a very uh, difficult year for me starting in January because there was a setback. Um, and I've been trying my best this year uh, to help. I, I can't, I'm, I'm nobody, uh, but I'm very pleased that I was able to convince uh, over about 250 Jewish people from across the world to come to Poland to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the liquidation of our ghettos in Benjamin Sosnowiec. And these people got to meet good Polish people in our communities, uh, meaning Benjamin Sosnowiec, Zawiercze. Uh, we started out in Krakow. And all these people have given me feedback. Thank you for telling us to come. Nobody has left upset that they have come. And now I'm at uh, what was, had been planned much earlier, this International Conference of Jewish Genealogists, first time ever in Poland. As I understand it, there are about 750 people registered. Again, most of the people have never been to Poland, uh, but they went past that uh, uh, bridge of saying, okay, I'll go, I'll experience, let me check this food out, taste it myself, and not listen to the critics and come up with my own opinion. And all the people I know that have been walking around this hotel and this conference have been quite pleased uh, and I'm sure quite surprised it wasn't what they were expecting. Um, and I will tell you that um, I had a kippah <laughs> made specially for this conference. It's the only one in the world with the Polish, American, and Israeli flags. And my name, by the way, my Hebrew names, I'm named after both my grandfather on my father's side and my great-grandfather on my mother's side who were murdered in the Holocaust. Most children of Holocaust survivors, the minute we are born, we are, ta we are I don't want to use the word tattooed, but the Holocaust is imprinted in us because we're named after our grandparents and great-grandparents who were murdered in the Holocaust. Uh, so from when I landed in Poland, in Krakow, Auschwitz, Benjin, Czela, Dombrowa, Gunica, Zawiercze, quite often walking on my own, by myself, I've been wearing this kippah. And it is my unprinted challenge to Poland because I'll be here for 17 days, it's the longest time I've ever been in Poland, that I haven't had one person look at me and give me a bad steer. But I will tell you that I'm an American. Uh, don't come to the United States, certainly to New York, and expect to, to say hello to a stranger on the street and expect somebody to smile back at you. It's not how we operate, how people work, walk around in New York City. But it is in Poland. And I know that. So whenever I've walked around, I've looked at somebody in their face, and I smiled, and I said, Jen Dubber. And everybody smiled back at me and said, Jen Dubber. I think Polish people and Jewish people need to learn World War II. They need to learn what happened, and I'm specifically talking about Poland now, on the territory of the former Polish borders. What happened in, for example, Benjamin Sosnowiec didn't happen in Łódź, didn't happen in Warsaw, and didn't happen in Lwów. Unfortunately for Polish people, for 50 years under communism, uh, Polish people were not taught the Holocaust. They were not talk, taught about Katyn they were not taught about Volin. Jewish people, Americans, we're not into history, but we were taught to a certain extent, some more than others, about the Holocaust. But we were not taught about World War II, other than Hitler invading Poland. We weren't taught about Stalin invading the eastern part of Poland. We weren't taught about to be very honest, I thought I was pretty knowledgeable. I, I have to profess um, that it was only this early this year that I learned about Volin. I did know about Katyn since high school. 
And somewhere on Facebook, somebody wrote something, a Polish person, about the Lolin. And I wasn't like, what was that? And I started to research it independently. And I was like, aghast. I had no idea. And earlier this year, I saw the movie in New York. It was shown, Volin. I think, um, I think Polish people need to see movies, not just The Zookeeper's Wife, which is a beautiful movie. It really doesn't show the horrors of the Holocaust. Polish people need to see the horrors of the Holocaust for Jews. Jewish people need to see what happened in Volin. Um, everybody needs to know about Katyn, which I knew about and uh, supported Polonia in New York not to move the, uh, the statue. Um, and everybody needs to sensitize themselves to the, I don't want to say the other side, there shouldn't be sides, but Polish people need to understand uh, Jewish sensitivities of the Holocaust and what happened on Polish soil. And Jewish people also need to be sensitized to what happened to Polish people. Okay? Um, I will say, I will mention Yevabna, what happened in Yevabna, happened in Yevabna, whoever did it, under what circumstances, to somehow now, 75 years later, determine the specifics, whatever that may be, is not going to be an answer as to whether Polish people were good or bad as a people during the Holocaust. To, to say that three million Polish Jews and three million Polish Catholics died is not an answer to me that they're equal. To say that 100,000 or 150,000 Poles died in Auschwitz and 900,000 or a million Jews died in Auschwitz Birkenau doesn't tell me that, well, we won the numbers game. It's not a numbers game. It's not a number, in my view. Every story, it's like the story of the Bernese group, should be researched and documented. There is no scale. We should learn from our past. It was not the Polish people who created the Holocaust. It was not the Polish people who built Auschwitz. It happened on Polish soil. I, I listened to a uh, Polish priest in New York at an event uh, last year say something, and I thought it was quite beautiful. What he's, he was talking about the uh, sad history of Poland. And he talked about after 123 years, uh, and I was very happy walking down Krakowski Przemysz the other night and seeing the lovely exhibits about Woodrow Wilson and Polish-American friendship. Um, after 123 years, as he put it in 1939, the Germans came and they conquered Poland and he said they contaminated Polish soil by murdering millions of people on Poland and defied Polish soil by murdering millions of people on Polish soil. And that's what everybody needs to understand. Uh, we need to learn our common history, the common history of World War II. And the history of World War II also is not a question of geography. What was happening in Benjamin versus what was happening in Ravna or Warsaw, but also time-wise. It's very important when you talk about what, ha what was happening in Warsaw with the Jews dying in the ghetto in 1942 was not happening in Benjamin, Sosnowiec, uh, where the Jews were employed and were getting rations uh, and were working for the Germans. Uh, uh, we have in America saying with regard to real estate, Location, location, location. The lucky thing for my father was he lived in Zawiercze, which was annexed by the Third Reich. And also, I have to say, there were good Poles and bad Poles. Most, neither here nor there. There were also good Germans. Uh, the Luftwaffe commander in Zawiercze um, tried the best he could to help and save the Jews. He tried the best he could to keep the Jews working 
in the, in the uh, Luftwaffe factory, they were repairing German army uniforms coming from the Eastern Front. And my father was lucky enough to be chosen among the 500 Jews who this commander, Willy Gabrecht, kept in Zawiercze till October 18th, uh, <clears throat> 1943. The ghetto was liquidated in August, but he and my uncle were there till October 18th. The later you got to Auschwitz, the better your chances of survival. And he was also awarded righteous among natures in Yad Vashem. Um, and uh, I am very touched here today to be sitting here in Warsaw because uh, I had no family in Warsaw. My family was all from southern Poland. But my father was very lucky. Uh, in November 1943, 60 days after he arrived in Auschwitz, he and my uncle were chosen to be shipped to Warsaw. After the Jewish Warsaw up up ghetto uprising in April 43, the Germans realized they needed able-bodied men to clean up the ghetto. And my father and uncle were in Genshufka, which also is called KL out Varsha, which was a slave labor work camp. And he was here from November 1943 till July 31st, 1944, working under the Germans, clean, cleaning up the ghetto. Um, and on July 31st, 1944, my father and uncle were sent on a death march to Dachau. And yesterday was August 6th. Yesterday, 74 years ago, my father arrived in Dachau, where he had the pleasure of spending the rest of the war till April 30th when he was liberated by the Americans. So to be here today in Warsaw, attending a Jewish conference, talking to you about my family's experiences is uh, quite emotional. Even though my family is not from Warsaw, the fact that my father worked as a slave laborer in the Genshufka camp and was sent out of here on a death march. Uh, 